Hi, I'm Michael. Welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about Before Sunset and really just the whole Before trilogy. I am joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, writer Trisha Arand. Hello, everybody. Writer Brian Bittner. Hello. And editor Alex Cayo. Hi. So the Before trilogy is one of my favorite set of movies of all time. But my first encounter with Before Sunset in particular was this uh, class I was taking in film school. So it was like my first or second year, maybe. And I was sitting in class and the teacher professor was trying to tell us about structure and how important it is to follow structure. And all movies have this like, you know, structure that they follow. And all of us like super cool film students were like, structure's like dumb, man, like <laughs> whatever. We're going to just like be experimental. And someone raised their hand and was like, hey, professor, what about like those movies like Before Sunrise, Before Sunset? Like they don't have any structure. They're just people talking, blah, blah, blah. And before the professor could be like, no, there's structure. Everyone was just like, yeah, like we don't need structure. <laughs> Sure. And like we're so cool. Like, Everyone started flipping sunset. desks and <laughs> right. it was just lighting things on fire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's how I remember it anyway. Uh, and so that was what was in my head when I went to then go see Before Sunset. It was like, it's this movie where there's no structure. And of course, now, nine, ten years later, whatever it's been since since college, uh, the reason I love Before Sunset is that it's so structured. Mm -hmm. And I've come to appreciate the amount of work that goes into making something feel unstructured and effortless. And that's just, I think, one of the greatest achievements of all three movies, really. By the totally. way, college was 11 years ago. <sighs> oh. <laughs> that's not math that needed to happen. <laughs> that's such a bummer. Is Sorry. that the beginning of college or the graduation? I remember the end. Yeah, graduation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. God, that was the end. The end. <laughs> <laughs> it's not better, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that was how I went into Before Sunset. What about what about cause, because I think with these movies, since the, you know they each one takes place nine years after mm -hmm. the previous one, it's like how long ago college was. Oh god. Uh, when and like what order you saw them in, or like what movies were out when you saw them matters a lot. So you know, totally. It's funny. I I remembered. Yeah. I saw Before Sunset first. Oh, really? I think I somehow I had heard about these great movies and I didn't know which one was which. And I it's like back in the days of Blockbuster and I like went and rented the wrong one, basically. Wow. But I still liked it a lot. But it was a lot of references to this thing that I hadn't seen. So I liked it. And then I like later watched Before Sunrise and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's what that was all about. And I watched Before Sunset again and it became like one of my favorite movies of all time. Wow. But I had like a weird. That's an interesting the same order. thing. The same thing happened with me with um, the Star Wars movies. Like oh, really? Like like when I was really young, my dad was like, Empire Strikes Back is like a very dark, upsetting <gasps> movie. Like maybe they should Did watch you? Return of the Jedi. And like I literally saw Return of the Jedi before Empire Strikes Back. So I'm like, why is Han wow. Solo like in a block? Like what is happening? Yeah. I just Yeah. Oh my I know it's wrong. <laughs> I mean space for I, I've, crying. <laughs> I've watched them so many times since then, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, my first both of these trilogies I wow. saw in a weird order. It's like being robbed of your childhood. <laughs> right. Or right. Well, because like the yeah, the, the I am your father thing mm. was not like a surprise. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I actually had a funny thing with that, too. I um, grew up with like a VHS, I think, of Return of the Jedi and Temple of Doom and not the others. So right. I think I saw them when I was a kid, but those are the movies I it's watched all, over and over It's all again. whichever VHS that, you had. That, that's yeah. how Indiana Jones happened to me, too. Mm -hmm. I think I, Last Crusade was like Indiana Jones for me. And then I was like, oh, there's other ones? All right. Oh, yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, Last Crusade was definitely like the one that I saw the most <laughs> in first. Yeah. My brain is broken. Like, I don't it's, understand. We didn't have the control. We were kids. Seven-year-olds aren't going, which order should I watch this in? Okay, but, okay. At least talking about the before trilogy. The first one is so different. It's so, it was such a, um, it was such this anomalous, like, burst of energy in the indie movie scene in the 90s. It was out there experimental was a word that everyone used to describe it like it was that sort of out of left field and to have not that back like I don't know I can't imagine not having seen that and then to to walk into this movie not that I think that before sunset doesn't hold up and stand alone because it absolutely does it is compelling and fascinating and these characters are every bit as well drawn as they are well, in the first movie what's interesting about my accidental out of order thing was i still liked it 
like that's how good before sunset is i actually still really liked it without having seen the previous movie yeah and i think that the the screenwriting work is there and the character work is obviously there because as we all know you know ethan hawk and julie delby co-wrote these movies and so all of that work is on the page and on the screen and so you absolutely can see it and experience it in that way but what a different way to experience it. Yeah. What, so I feel like almost that we saw different movies. It's incorrect. Well, and, but one, I, I saw the movie you saw eventually. Oh, but okay. Yeah, sure. Delayed. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So did, did you see them, Trisha, like when they came out or yeah, when in Right. The so process? 95, I would have been too young probably. Um, so it would have had to have been. So here's what I think it was. I did see the first one in college and then I saw the second one like, a couple weeks or months later because it was already out. Mm -hmm. And so I think whoever showed me the first one must have also showed me the second one. I actually advocate, I've sh I've now a couple times shown them back to back. So when mm. Before Midnight was coming out, I had like a viewing at my house for people and who wanted to rewatch them or whatever. And I did like themed dinners. Of course I did. Uh, <laughs> where I like made French food for the first, like a first course of French food and then like a set, no, Austrian food and then like okay. a second yeah. course of French food. And of, of course, and then we did a, like did a double feature at my house. So then we were all ready to go watch uh, Before Midnight. Did you get baklava afterwards? <laughs> no. Because I like to do I that know. after every movie anyway. I know. <laughs> I did miss a chance there on the Greek food, but I, I actually recommend to people that you space out. It, like don't don't yeah. actually do a double feature if you mm. if you're trying to show these movies to someone who has never seen them before let the first one breathe let people wonder and even if there's you know spoilers and easily accessible information on the internet yeah i, I think it's still worth live it. in the mystery of it yeah. a little bit that's you know? what i do with tv shows it's like yeah. i never watch the season finale of a show and then go watch the season premiere of the next one like i like to give it mm -hmm. a little bit of that time mm. wait that happened for the people experiencing it in real time. Right. Yeah, with everything being on demand now and we like binge watching as a thing, I just wanted to like advocate for a second yeah. for not binge watching everything. Like even if you can, because right. something like this where it's impossible to separate these movies from the actual process of making them and from the actual people who made them, which we can get into more, but the nine years of like mystery uncertainty feeling of loss feeling of wonderment it's just like the whole reason that this worked at the time is because that gap between 1995 and 2004 was a time when if you didn't exchange information you did not have a way to get in touch with somebody right so like that was a time where you couldn't just look your ex up on facebook right <laughs> or social media or anything if you wanted to know if your ex was like out there you just kind of had to wonder and like think is this person thinking about me do they ever think about that time <laughs> and that's kind of what these movies are treading on they're treading on that emotion and so like trying to give your self that emotion even if you kind of have to manufacture it by not reading articles or whatever you have to do i would encourage doing that well, when i was rewatching these movies recently for lfts um i have a friend who hadn't seen any of them and so i invited him over to watch them and it was really fun because th it was based out you know a couple weeks apart mm -hmm. and and it was you know watching before sunset when he's like in the bookshop and then she's mm -hmm. there and he's, like, and he's like wait wait a minute wait what's <laughs> going on like wait wait a minute it's like it was really fun because i didn't really have that experience as watching out of order so it was fun to watch somebody else have that process yeah. happen in yeah. real time and this is what you're we were talking about when we we're writing the script of the video is about the mystery piece. Like mm -hmm. the mystery piece is really mm -hmm. sort of what the structure is. Right. Yeah. Questions. Lots of questions are either in the air or raised throughout that kind of keep you hooked. Really quick before we move on, just Brian, you didn't get to tell us your story of how you the order you saw them and when you saw them. And so Alex talked about running the wrong uh, movie, which I kind of did in retrospect in 2004 when I worked at Hollywood Video. And uh, so all the new movies, the two, I know what movies came out in 2004 because they were all on the, I was mm -hmm. putting them on the shelves. So I remember putting Brad Pitt from Troy and Thomas Hayden Church from uh, <laughs> Sideways in the window. Nice. Um, <laughs> But uh, I rented 2004's After the Sunset, the Brett Ratner <gasps> film. And oh, uh, no. I'm sorry to say that Pierce Brosnan and Selma Hayek's chemistry is not quite up to par with oh. that of uh, Ethan Hawke and Julie Delphi. Wait, oh, Brett Ratner boy. directed a Pierce Brosnan and Selma Hayek movie? It's like, a, yeah, it's like a corny, action-y, 
almost rom commy like and it came out the same month. year as before sunset. Uh-huh. <laughs> Wow. After the sunset. <laughs> After the sunset. So, so you were incredibly confused. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, no. So I, yeah, I remember before sunset, like seeing it on the shelf being like, I'm, I understand this is a thing. And then I just never got around to watching. They were always on the list. And uh, I didn't actually watch any of them until uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I was just like, thank you for like giving me a reason to finally sit down and watch these movies. <laughs> but the only unfortunate thing is watching them knowing that there's a next movie yeah. you know watching before right. sunrise being like well i don't know if they get together in six months i'm guessing they don't but like because the next one's nine years later so we'll see and then watching before sunset up until the last five minutes going i i were, i really want to know what's happening in this plot of this movie but i also know there yeah. is a third movie so right. in some capacity they're together again in nine years i don't know what that is yet but like it kind of takes away it doesn't totally take away the urgency of this of before sunset because i felt so on the edge of my seat the whole like i love the urgency God, of that movie yeah. being like oh my gosh they only have a little bit of time da, da, da. <laughs> it's but, so good at that but in the back of my mind i was going but there's also a third movie <laughs> like it's it's a safety, so, you know, safety net right yeah yeah, yeah it, it is interesting how much before sunset how effective that ticking time bomb is mm-hmm. just right. how st- stressful it is and that it's all happening in real time is just like so great and beautiful but like stressful and just accomplishes all the things and heightens everything and provides that pressure to make the characters finally open up when it's like there's if you're gonna say something you gotta say it now because yeah there's a plane that needs yeah, to be I mean, caught that's why it's by far my favorite of the trilogy because um, agree. it's it's just from the first moment of that movie there's tension and there's yeah a question hanging in the air and it never lets you go yeah and man like for a movie to be real-time conversation to have that much of a ticking time bomb stress emergency feeling underneath it all is so amazing um yeah just yeah. what an accomplishment and i think that's part of the reason i mean when you said it's your favorite of the three the rest of us are like, yeah yeah mm-hmm. like yeah. because michael maybe disagrees but i don't oh. disagree I've, I've i have a newfound appreciation for before midnight but we can talk about that later okay well i just think that is part of what makes before sunset so effective yeah is that ticking clock it's established right at the beginning and even more than before sunrise, because before sunrise does have this sort of like lovely, almost slowness to it in some places where they don't feel this sense of urgency necessarily. It, it starts to build as the, the, the night goes on. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're watching in like an eight hour evening. Over right. The exactly. Right. Yeah. It's right. not actually an 80 minute real time, right. real deal situation, which before sunset actually is. Right. Yeah. And so what you're, you know, just thinking about it's i guess the most movie ish of all of the three of these movies where it's a lot less experimental in the sense that there's a ticking clock so there's urgency there's goals there's stakes there's some serious of these, like, problems mm-hmm. there's yeah. serious problems real so barriers there's yeah. like some actual plot going on right. but it's so yeah. well disguised right. you don't actually notice it and so for that reason i think it is one of the strongest entries into the trilogy because it it is a movie with some of these like undergirding things, but they are so invisible. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah like like that it's being done in real time is kind of the experimental right. aspect of it to like be executing a, like a full plot structure of like exactly. revealing both of these characters arcs over time. But it's just this like naturally organically seemingly. And such a flow. catharsis by the end. You know, like yeah. So much catharsis. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I feel like the, the first and third movie are very special, but. I feel like when I watched them, I thought, okay, this is like a really good version of something I've seen kind of before. Whereas before Sunset, the extra layer of it being real time just made it all that more special and all that more like, wow, this is this is just a a, a thing. Like, you know, mm-hmm. well, and, and think because of all the baggage that, that they bring into Before Sunset. Sure. Are you talking about the actors, the characters? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know the story about the actors, but the characters I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm curious to know what is going on with the actors. Sure. But yeah, character wise, just the fact that there's so many questions, there's so much they don't know about each other, what's happened the last nine years. Like there's so much not being said, so many secrets, so many things that they're hiding from each other. Like there's just so much more to play with than a meet cute, you know, first meeting yeah. or we've been together for the last, you know, nine, 10 years. Yeah. Um, so it just, yeah, there's just so much to play with and before sunset that you just, 
in all fairness, just don't have in the other two movies. Right. And mm-hmm. you can track the, the rising complications. It's like, yeah. oh, there's a time constraint. And it's, were you there in Vienna? And right. wait, did we sleep together? Did we not sleep together? And then it's, by the way, we're both in relationships. And then it's like the car scene. You know, it's just like, yeah. Yeah. even though it's just people talking, it's like the stakes actually get higher and higher. Right. The they do. Goes. Yeah. And I feel like the, it, it might be my favorite midpoint of any mm. movie mm. when it's just, she casually mentions like, so I read that you're married and have a child. It <laughs> is. And it just like changes everything. Uh-huh. So it is brilliant. the most casually delivered. And I, I think it's in like a slightly wider or more medium shot. It's like it's a two not shot a close, of them. It's, yeah. right. it's the most casually delivered mind like explosion moment right. that like completely stabs you in the heart, you know, as an audience <laughs> yes, member. Yes, and yeah. you're just like, what, what what did you just do to me, Linklater? Like, I don't understand. I've been treasuring this, like, this little ember of hope in my, like, hoping it will be okay and they'll just be together and it'll be fine. And it's like, oh, no, there's all this, these morals I have to... It's all this real life in here. <laughs> right. Well, and, and it's interesting uh, because of the atmosphere of it. There's something so dreamlike about the first movie where it doesn't seem like they are in real time. But with it being in this like harsh, glaring sunlight in Before Sunset, mm-hmm. the whole movie, it feels too real in a way that I think amplifies those complications. You know, thinking about them walking in the garden right before she does drop that bombshell. Mm-hmm. Which is like, oh, it's it's almost like, the way the light is playing on them and how glary it is and how it's funny like, you say glary because I think of it as like magic hour of the movie because it's all just <laughs> right. like in that sort of no, right. that, before sunset that, like, right. scene in, that scene in the garden there are uh-huh. these it's really bright, bright patterns yeah. there's yeah. really yeah. bright patches and everything where especially when he's trying to flirt with her and like pulls her onto his lap right and, oh. Oh, it's, so cr- yeah, we're yeah. all just like yikes. <laughs> <laughs> when on the, when on the boat later, that's like total magic. That's hour. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were saying that 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 was one of the challenges of the film was that I think they said it was shot over fifteen days and they just had the small window of time that right. they could shoot every day, and so it just required Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy to be like amazing and just show up and do eight minutes Pick up of where you left off, mm-hmm. right, and just like be able to pump out the takes and get it while they ran that. They did time. it. Yeah. Yeah. You're mentioning Before Sunrise and how it has that dreamy feel. And mm-hmm. I think watching it again recently, I really appreciated how it captures that feeling of like an endless night. You know, yeah. it almost reminds me of even like going back to like, you know, sleepovers at your friend's house or something where there's just kind of this magic quality of a night that just could go on forever. And it's almost like time has stopped. And, and that yeah. movie actually by the end of it has captured it for me, you know? Totally. You know, it, it kind of takes a while to get going, but once they're like, in the thick of it and they're kind of deciding this is going to be our one night you you really are with them and i think that the fact that it isn't in real time where and there's no sense of like they don't really place us within the city either right. like i mean i don't know I, I obviously am not super familiar with vienna or anything like that but there's sort of like a time out of place quality to it. And because and part of that is because Jesse and Celine are both strangers in that city. It's not mm, the home city mm-hmm. for either one of them. And so you get that feeling of like, oh, travel opens you up to these new experiences. So that's like baked into there. But then also the like cuts between parts of their conversation. Imagine if you had to write a transition from like the poem that they hear on the, you know, while they're walking by the sun to like, the next thing, which is where they're listening to the fortune teller or whatever, you know, like imagine if you had to write a transition, like Mm. how does that conversation transition? Mm. It's ugly. It's clunky probably. (laughs) Right. But just by cutting away from those only to the meaty and sort of like lyrical parts of the conversation, does it create again, this like sort of very romantic time out of place? Well, it's funny because in Before Sunset, I feel like the transition's are clunky but in a very natural yes. that's how dialogue it's, it's works al- it's almost like part of the story you know because yeah. it's like there is a clunkiness to their interaction for a lot of it because you know, they're they're dancing around a lot of right. truth There's a lot of subtext yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 yes 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 yeah it was interesting because most recently i i think all this started because i remembered the the final scene of before sunset and mm-hmm. heard the dancing and i was like i should go watch that scene again and i watched mm-hmm. that scene it's like well now i'm gonna watch the whole movie <laughs> yeah and so i watched the whole movie and then it's like okay well now i have to rewatch all of them um and it, it happens was, <laughs> right, we've this, all been there yeah. yeah it was interesting because i 
I think I'd maybe seen before sunrise once and then I think I've seen before sunset a couple times mm. but revisiting before sunrise it was interesting the kind of the the different form that it takes where like we're saying it's it's not in real time it's this whole night but also that it's they're interacting with other people yeah and like even you know the the guys they stop and talk to on the bridge that are having their like one act play right, tonight right. Where he's like the back of a cow and like it, it's interesting how they kind of use like other characters to kind of interact with and kind of fill in the characters that mm-hmm. way in that one but in before sunset it's yeah. just the yeah two of them as soon as they leave the bookstore yeah well in before sunrise part of what i appreciated about watching it again was seeing how they the way they react to their characters kind of sets up their dynamic you know so when the fortune teller comes totally celine finds it very mystical and romantic and kind of interesting and then jesse kind of shoots it down it's like well she's saying that because that's what you want to hear and mm-hmm. that's what they do and <laughs> how you know how does she know that about you she's yeah. about everybody that was that was an eye-opener for for me because i am always the guy to point out the like logical fallacy of that thing mm-hmm. uh-huh. which drives my girlfriend crazy <laughs> and then i'm watching yeah. this movie it's like a mirror being held up <laughs> yeah to you. absolutely because i'm watching this movie going like Oh well, the fortune teller is probably just da, da, da. and the poem guy. He probably just writes that poem to everybody. But then when <gasps> Ethan Hawke says it, when Jesse yes. says it, then like logical me is like, that's what I thought. But then right. the emotional movie me is going like, you dick. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, that, literally, that was my. You just yeah. robbed yeah. this scene of the magic. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I'm well, definitely I'm... more of the Celine in those situations. Same. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think that this movie, uh, and, and by that I mean, I guess these two. If we can sort of cordon off before sunset and before sunrise yeah. into like they, definitely they, they feel more like similar thing. things yeah. Yeah, yeah than before midnight is which i i do enjoy before midnight and i think it's fascinating to talk about um so i hope we do get to it but like if we can sort of talk about those i do think the existence of these other characters in before sunrise do create a lot a lot of thematic depth i, I don't know maybe this is what you were saying about their facades Right. Because when they're so new to each other in that movie, those facades are are carefully crafted and they sort of like we see how they then are broken down, but in a much like more abstract way where there's no reason for them that they really have to hide these things other than there there's someone that's new. So like you could be completely honest with a stranger. It really wouldn't cost you much. Um, but and so the other characters, I think, are eroding those facades. But when you just lock them together in before sunset you absolutely can't have any other characters eroding those facades it has to be just jesse and celine because there's so much at stake when i think the ticking time bomb and the fact that there's so much to talk about like if another character tried to intrude on that conversation they would just ignore them get out of here other characters we're busy right there's no time for that yeah 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 you're yeah you're right yeah another thing that was interesting to me that i was i was thinking about when watching them is i feel like so obviously those are romantic movies like they're such beautiful portrayals of love at different stages of life and all these things in europe (laughs) right the europe beautiful scenery of europe doesn't hurt these movies at all which is so interesting fact is that originally richard linklater was thinking of these the the, uh before sunrise to take place i think on a train in san antonio San Antonio, yeah Yeah. just like really yeah Mm -hmm. i thought it was based on his real experience like in philadelphia Oh, it was in Philadelphia. Yeah, but oh, he's I thought it was from, in Europe. No, 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 it was in Philadelphia. But <laughs> he's, but he's from Texas, so like that makes right. sense. Yeah. yeah. But and it, it was, I think it was like the lawyer, or, like his rep or someone that was like, "There's all these like tax breaks in Europe. Like, why don't you <laughs> set it in Europe?" That worked out. And it, yeah, that worked out. It's, it's a very key part of it, which is so interesting to think that at some point that wasn't there. It seems like the opposite of of what you hear about in Hollywood. It's like, right. usually it's like, what if we set it in LA so we don't have to travel? <laughs> or what if we set it like as close as possible? Well, it's interesting because I think so core to Jesse's story is being an American in Europe. Mm, like, right. That is such a hit like backbone of who he is where he is a person out of his own culture who is sort of longing for something else right he doesn't want what he has he wants right. something else and so and those and that, of and us that continues through before sunset exactly um and into before midnight honestly where right. like he you know has sort of made a life there now but and even now he so wants he, something back in america he wants something back in america <laughs> yeah. yeah there he's jesse is so american and so like even the their conflicts and sort of their like miscommunications are not framed as being cultural they very clearly are 
And so I think that goes back to like the casting and the writing, which is like you actually have a French woman and two American men right. writing these movies together. Right. So you and, have to have those voices. And even though they weren't credited uh, on Before Sunrise, mm-hmm. like they did bring in their own uh, selves to to the process where Julie Delpy was saying to Richard Linklater, like what is in the script is would not get me off the train. What would get me off the train is this. And it's like they she helped craft jesse into like who jesse the jesse for her celine would be you know so it's like what an interesting approach to filmmaking versus like i wrote a script and you guys have to say it now right yeah it's kind of getting back to what i was saying earlier was re-watching it again these characters like i feel like i'm i'm not in love with Julie Delpy's character, I'm not in love with Ethan. Uh, Trish is. I but, am. I mean, <laughs> like I, I even, even part three of her character. Cause, yeah. Because who? <laughs> I don't think before midnight is kind to her, but yes, I am in love with okay. her. <laughs> but basically, the the point I'm trying to make is that I feel like I'm I'm neither in love with him or her, but I get why they are in love with each other, and like. I can kind of empathize and put myself in there where like he would do things where I'm like, you're kind of an idiot, dude. Like I don't, I'm, right. I have trouble with that. Or she would say things or I have opinions and I'm like, well, okay, but like calm down a little bit where I have that. But I feel like that just, I feel like it, it's a good representation of like three dimensional characters and that they, they clearly right. intentionally allowed both characters to have flaws just like anybody has flaws. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I feel like, it it part of I think what makes it work so well is that they they are flawed characters, but you can see how they are attracted to each other yeah. right. through their flaws. Right, and they're allowed to express beliefs in the moment that they don't actually live by, right. which is also really critical because that is something people are and do all the time, where we express these ideals that we want to believe in, that we want to believe about ourselves. But then when push comes to shove, we do not live by them. And so I think that's one of the most interesting things about the first couple of movies where that dichotomy is obvious. It's like they're expressing all of these beautiful ideals, like Celine is this incredible romantic and idealist and everything. And then she absolutely does not live by it. Nine years later, we find out that she has gone back on everything that she said she thought Mm. about love everything that she thought about relationships and she had you know she sort of knows that about herself and then at the same time is expressing new ideals that she then again is not gonna live by it's just well i i think (laughs) think with yeah what's so beautiful i feel like in before sunset especially yeah as you watch the facades break down it's really fun to see how yeah, Celine earlier in the movie kind of is very confidently making mm-hmm. declarations about this is what life is like and this is how you should need to you know behave and here's how I think about love and here's how I think about this and she kind of puts forward this confident veneer of I have, I have it figured out yeah and then we find out in the car it's like no I, I, I like I hate that I'm so hopeless romantic and I feel so much inside that I have to numb myself and and I think it's just so honest because I've done that before too. You know, yeah. I, I just the idea of like, I've got life figured out. Like, this is the way it is now. And like, I'm going to live like this. And it's like, no, I still feel everything and it's too much. <laughs> and what do I do with myself? <laughs> so it's just, there's so much truth in this movie. It's like, it's painful and it just hits you so hard and directly. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. funny to watch and like try to not really choose a side as much as before sunrise, I'm watching the movie going like, okay, Ethan Hawke's like kind of jerky sometimes, but she seems like, basically perfect like you know not and then i'm watching before sunset and like kind of the same thing but then like towards the car scene i'm like okay she's like getting a little crazy and then before midnight i'm just like oh she's like going all you know and it's like not that i want to uh say oh this character's right or this character's wrong but it's just interesting to sort of you're always battling who you're kind of almost rooting for because they are each other's opponents so you're at any given moment you're sort of going oh, i wish you were i wish you were kind of on this the other person's side right now and well, it's just Speaking yep. of Before Midnight, because um, I watched when I first saw that movie in theaters, I was kind of in the camp of just like, yeah, Celine is just being very difficult in this movie. She's it's too much. Like, Jesse's a great guy, like, too difficult. Watching it again um, and really like, hearing where she's coming from mm-hmm. and like what she's actually saying, not just that they're having an argument, but like what she's actually dealing with in herself. I was like, oh my God, no, there's like, I was totally writing her off the first time I saw this. Like, She's dealing with all these b- 
big existential questions about her life and what's right. happened to her and she got pregnant without like wanting to get pregnant like with twins with twins mm-hmm. like like so much happened that was not part of her plan or that in, even in her control and she's dealing with the aftermath of that and they you know they both are in a lot of ways and so yeah it was interesting how in the first viewing before midnight i kind of just wrote her off as like you're being a little too irrational you're being too and this time it's like no like i'm listening to what you're saying and oh my god like this is really serious what you both both of what they're grappling with is very serious you know her life has left her control and his you know child is growing up without Mm -hmm. him you know it's they both have serious issues it's such a it's such a rude awakening that movie too you know like remember (laughs) after it was done i was just sitting there in silence and i was just like man that's tough my girlfriend my girlfriend said like well you know that's life and i was like yeah that's not why i watch these movies (laughs) like like the first two movies are like fairy tales and the third movie is like nope like here's what happens i don't know i don't know if the second movie is a fairy tale i would say 80 percent of it's a fairy tale like it's just sort of like oh they reconnected and like everything's going great and then obviously then the complications like really come in. I think the fairy tale intense. part. I think the fairy tale part is when she shows up at the bookstore. That part's a fairy tale because nobody ever walks into a bookstore like that. Sure. Like nobody shows up in the life of a person without a call or a text. And like now we have social media. It does not happen. Your old flame is not going to show up at your book reading. It's not real. Um, so that part is a fairy tale. But once you make that leap, I think that a lot of the conversation really is pretty organic in the sense that like if you are in a situation where you've had questions and you've lived in this uncertainty and you've lived in this like empty space um where you've wondered about this person wondered about this person but also you have to exist as a human in this world so like you you go to coffee and you like propose to walk around and you like get these false starts where she's like it's shopping day he's like you want to go shopping she's like i don't want to go shopping <laughs> like all of that is very well observed sure. but it has a fairy tale ending but i feel like it's well, when earned. i first when i first saw it i didn't i really didn't know that it meant for sure they were gonna stay together you know, I oh sure. I I, I thought it was very ambiguous to mm. my brain the first well, time. Well, they, they weren't going to stay together forever. It was right, obvious right. he was going to stay there and miss his plane. Right. But yeah. like, what that I feel meant like ultimately. right. It is it is the happiest of endings of the three. of the three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. Right. I feel like and, it's and like, I like that it it like if that was the end of the franchise, mm-hmm. it's a great ending. But it's also an ending that's like leaves you going. Well, I want to see the next movie now. Yeah. Well, and so I feel like sort of quickly talk about what I was saying why why I feel like it's an earned happy ending is because again I think that midpoint that just like I th- I feel like it does feel like a fairy tale up to the point where like oh they found each other and look they like still like each other and like how do I look oh you look beautiful and like there's all that where it's like clearly they still like each other and then it's like and then reality hits where like they can't they right. can't be together the rules of our society says like you know if you can't and you find out other, like blah, blah, the amount blah. of pain that they right. that they've both been right. experiencing yeah. right. in between these movies, and yeah. you know, especially Ethan Hawke's character that when he goes into just like right. the emotional pain he's been in, like right. it's, it's not Oof. it's and not so, right. Like, yeah, them choosing to be together in the end is like happy in one sense. But I, I my mom watched these because she watches any movie that we're talking about and listen from the screenplay. Mm-hmm. God bless her, uh, Mama Tucker. Yes. <laughs> uh, and she was a little like lukewarm at the end of this. Like, wait, really? He's just gonna like leave his wife and child and move to France Fair. and be with this? And like, that's a legitimate like yeah. to have the happy ending between them means sacrificing and hurting other people. Sure. And I think that's kind of what I've come to appreciate about Before Midnight is that you get right. to see the consequences of that. Like, well, it lets that play out. I, I love the opening of Before Midnight mm-hmm. with him and his son in the airport, mm-hmm. and then watching his son go like. It's what a great so nuanced yeah. where like you can like you can tell there's like history and like everything isn't perfect but like the sun is doing okay the sun is doing better than ethan hawk is and like i feel like just they establish it all so like efficiently and all the nuances of it that yeah i feel like that scene and then the hotel scene is just like right. the well, best well, battle scene i've ever seen in my life but we can't i mean it's really good and it, it's almost like a master class in acting truthfully but we can't discount the introduction of twins because they complicate everything in a really important way. Like, so when you have him leaving his son at the airport, you're just like, man, it is a toll. 
you know, this is the sacrifice he made. He walked away from like a family. And because that is one of his central like blockades in the previous movie, which is like, I cannot leave my son. Every time I look at him, he he just makes me so happy. But at the same time, I'm miserable. So I don't know what to do. And so then when you see the logical extension of that plot line, it's very compelling. But then he gets into the car and there's daughters there's two of them and it just becomes this whole thing where if it were just celine like imagine if there were no daughters imagine if it were just celine she would be a thousand times more unreasonable or i don't know i don't think that's actually fair because i think she's incredibly reasonable yeah, throughout. I don't think but unreasonable like, is the right word no but, yeah. but just like her arguments take on less weight because she isn't fighting for herself only she's fighting for her daughters and for like the unity of their family and you have to have that weight behind that argument in the hotel room because if you don't it just becomes about like sort of this like oh do you love me do you not it's this like nebulous idea of you're on book tour i'm whatever It, it becomes it takes away the weight of the passage of time. The passage of time exists in the person of those two girls. But, you know, I, I do feel like that was the revelation for me on the second viewing was that it's okay also that she's arguing for herself. You know, sure, she has, definitely. She has a career path that she's on. She has like sure. a, a future she sees for herself. And he's asking her because of his life choices to basically end it and kind of go back to being a housewife yeah. potentially in Chicago in a place she doesn't want to live, you know. Yeah. losing control of her life yet again, maybe for another decade of her life, you know, that I, from the second viewing, I'm like, okay, yeah, that is worth having an argument about. You know, totally. It's okay to want the life that you want. I just and, think, yeah. yeah, he sort of comes at her with an army though, right. in terms of like, oh, I've got other family. And so it's important for her to also have an army behind sure. her from a, like a character standpoint. Mm-hmm. Sure. I think the thing that that also stung for me watching before sunset i think what's also in, so there's multiple things that are interesting and i'm going to stop myself and go back to the beginning of my thought breathe michael which is that seeing these films at different ages has mm. definitely changed how i right. perceive them and you know <laughs> to, 2012 was before 13 2013 okay yeah. So yeah, so I, I saw that, what was that? That was six was years before ago. Before Midnight in 2013. Yeah, before Midnight in 2013. So it was like mid-20s where it was like, I got intellectually what the debate was, but like that was still like far away. Watching it more recently, I'm like, oh, that's, I see that now. That's just over the hill. That's 40s yeah. and that's like not that far away. That's close, yeah. And I think specifically Ethan Hawke's character, there's like a, a moment where she's talking about like, you know the responsibilities that are split up in the day-to-day life and like you know you're upstairs writing and like if you feel like inspired you don't like come down you stay up and you keep doing stuff and as a creative person i feel like that hit me where i was like oh yeah like i feel like i do that too where it's like well but like i'm being creative right now and like something special is happening so i have to ignore real life and just like i completely empathize then with her as like the spouse of a person like that like how unfair that must feel of like oh you just happen to feel a certain way so that means you get to throw your responsibilities out the window and i think that that was another thing that helped me also connect with her a lot more at this time around it's like understanding the kind of unfairness of almost just our our notions of what certain jobs allow behavior of or something i love your pro wendy when you watch the shining If I'm in here and I'm writing. Not to, <laughs> not to dive too deeply into it, but because it is textual, like gender roles are a thing that we tend not to think about until we actually have to live in them. And so if you look at the before, if you look at before sunrise, they're not talking about stuff like that. And they're really not even talking about politics, right? Because those things are sort of, again, with this ethereal, it doesn't exist in the real world. It's just this like nebulous idea or this dream that they're so this having. this night out of time. Yeah, exactly. If, if you look at that, they don't have to talk about these like real world things that do impact our lives in dramatic ways. And so in as ugly as it feels for them to have that conversation in Before Midnight where you're just like, 
gender roles. Why are we having to talk about this? The scene where she's talking about like, oh, little fairies clean up the thing. That's and one of my little, favorite Oh, it's so bits. good. That's it's one of my favorite bits. So, so, so good. And so, again, smart, well-observed, yeah. like all of that stuff. But just, it doesn't, we don't like that stuff encroaching into our movies, but it would be disingenuous for it to not for them at that place in their lives because that is their day-to-day life. It makes those characters feel lived in Whew, in an unpleasant <laughs> right. way. Yeah, it's too real. I was going to say, because I, I said I, I showed these films to a friend of mine who hadn't seen them before, and we got to the last one to Before Midnight. And you know when that was wrapping up, you know when she, she leaves the hotel room and says, it's really simple. I don't love you anymore. And, and he was just like, he was like, this is too real. Yeah. <laughs> this is too much. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is too real. <laughs> it's one of the movies that I remember very much being in the theater for. And just yeah. like the audience was reacting like literally as if there was like a battle happening. Where mm-hmm. people were like, oh, because like, they're so mean to each they're other. Mean. They're yeah. so they're mean. They're cool. And it gets really ruthless. Feel, like each like moment. But it was, it was all just so clear how like inside the movie everyone was right. in the theater and I, I love when that that happens it brings up uh trisha there's a question that i wanted to add been wanting to ask you for months off mike and i had never gotten the chance so i'm gonna okay. ask you on mike great uh you list train spotting as one of your favorite movies yeah it is have you seen train spotting too yes i have and um i love this will the... make sense soon okay great i was like i do trilogy. not know how this is related <laughs> um i love those characters so so much that Train Spotting 2 is one of those movies. I, I really have only seen it once. I'd love to see it again. Uh, but I remember walking into it and just being like, I'm here for anything. And I basically can't be disappointed. Mm-hmm. So um, I do think there are some really insightful, impactful moments in that movie that hit me right in my soul because I know the character so well. But then there are others that really do not land. Right. Yeah, I, I think... There's a lot of criticism of Trainspotting 2, and I understand the criticism, but I love the movie so much. I saw it twice in the theater. I've seen it again since. Uh, so for context, for someone who hasn't seen Trainspotting. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, so I'm not going to go into like what Trainspotting 2 is yeah, about, yeah. but what I will say that I really liked about the movie was Trainspotting was a movie about boys in their early 20s. Trainspotting 2 is about men in their early 40s. And Trainspotting 2 is very much reliant on the plot of Trainspotting in the sense that like the events of the first film are why the events of the second film are happening. But in terms of who the characters are and what they're experiencing, Ewan McGregor has this monologue about just like, I, I had a uh, it's an aneurysm or I forget exactly what it is. He says, and the doctor says, oh, you'll be great for another 40 years. And he's like, great, what do I do with it? You know, it's just sort of like those like those crises you're having in your 40s going like, what do I do with my life? I don't know what I'm here for, as opposed to train spotting, which is like we're running around, we're having fun and it's all Mm -hmm. good. And I think that's what I had the same thought watching the before trilogy. See, tied it all back together. Watching these characters (laughs) 10 years apart where it's like, oh, you're going through what people go through in this decade of their their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's like as much as you want to go, I just want to watch you be happy for for an hour and a half. And then like everything's good. It's like, yeah, but that's not if we want to talk about relationships, we have to talk about what happens when Prince Charming and, you know, Cinderella get together and it's 10 years later. And it's like, you know, it's not all happy all the time yeah but that's why before midnight i think is such a like a punch to the gut because mm-hmm. <laughs> usually we stop it before sunrise you yeah know? that's usually where movies stop or sorry before sunset yeah usually usually movies stop at the before sunset ending which is despite all odds they're going to get together and it's going to work out somehow but we're not going to deal with the details of the complications of how that's going to work out it's an interesting choice not to put a ticking clock on before midnight i mean mm. beyond the title but like <laughs> It's right, because there really is the like, other two no ticking films. Clock. The other two films have some ticking clock. There's less of one in the first movie. There's a really intense ticking clock, as we've talked about in the second one. They really didn't put a ticking clock on the third one. And the other thing about the third movie is that the credulity of watching these two characters talk to each other and the amount of discovery that there might still be there. Is a little strange. Yeah. My least favorite part of the movie is their walk to the hotel, actually, because yeah. they're still talking as if it's one of those, you know, f- meetings, you know, yeah. where it's two people like catching up, they're mm. meeting. Actually, my friend I was watching with, he was like, people who've been together for 10 years don't talk they like don't this. They don't talk like this. They don't, they don't like walk and have like philosophical nope. conversations and like share their insights they've had recently. You know, maybe 
maybe it can happen if you've just been really busy with the kids and this is your first chance. I think that's what they were trying to play, but it it feels like it strains credulity in a way that the first two movies don't have to deal with because they're meeting for the first time twice. Exactly. And so like part of me wonders, I'm not trying to rewrite these movies. I really like them. I do think it's a bold and interesting choice to do it the way that they did. Um, but part of me just wonders like, okay, what if there was some kind of separation where they hadn't seen each other? She was, he was on a book tour or she was like traveling abroad for her work or whatever. And it had been a month and like he brings the kids to visit her in Budapest and they have like only a little limited amount of time together and, and they hadn't seen each other in a while or they hadn't been in close contact. If there'd be new information to share, if that would sort of like create that sense of discovery that the first two movies really capture and, and and I don't think the stakes feel manufactured necessarily because I think they're real because that kind of the kind of day to day stuff that we're talking about really does erode relationships. And then it always does come to a head like that is real. There's always a moment of not just one. Usually there's like a cascade of moments that like split people up. But those moments do exist and are real. So I'm not saying that's not lived in or earned. I'm just wondering, like, I don't know. I'm fascinated by the choice. Well, I mean, there is, a, it's not quite to the extent of like a ticking time bomb, but there is like, you know, the kids are being watched tonight. They have this one night in the hotel, which just the two of them. Mm. And I feel like that does kind of, and, you know, the first half of the movie, you don't really see the two of them talking. It's him talking to the other right. guys and she's in the kitchen with the people and then they're together at the dinner table, but it's very much the like, we're playing like I our love roles. that dinner I'm, table it's, scene. I, yeah, it's yeah. so amazing. And so so I think there there is, it's it kind of achieves a different thing, but I think there is a certain amount of like, it's not so much a ticking time bomb, but it's like they have to be together with just each other for maybe the first time in a while. And I think that is kind of what gives the opportunity for the kind of conflict that comes out to come out. I think it's also something real, very real about the the expectation you have when you're with someone that you haven't had alone time with in a while. I think we've mm -hmm. all had those moments where it's mm -hmm. like you haven't seen your partner in two weeks and they're finally coming back and in your mind you're going, oh, we're just going to have the most, the greatest night together. And then as soon as any little bit of conflict comes up, it's like, three times as strong because it's like ruining this ex expectation you mm, have. Right. And I think there was totally. a plan and yeah. it's all screwed up now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think personal experience wise, you know, I feel like I've, you know, my girlfriend I've known for nine years now and I feel like I still like we walk and talk. We were just on vacation in Arizona and I feel like we were talking about things and I was like, oh, I didn't know that about you. And so I, I don't know. I feel like there's nine years. Yeah. 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 Uh oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the funny things that Julie Delpy said was that like both actors talked about how much it takes out of them to do these movies. Yeah. yeah. And Julie Delpy joked that yeah, it takes us nine years to feel up to doing it again. Wow. <laughs> because it's just that exhausting. Which brings me to this question: uh, If 2022 sees it before midday, what would you guys want it to be? I was just thinking about, yeah, a next movie. I mean, the problem is I'm not in my 50s, so I don't know if I mm -hmm. am qualified to say what it should be. But I'm 1,000% not qualified. I want them to be split. I want them, like, I, I don't actually want that, but I want to hear what these characters would say about it. Mm. Like, I want them, maybe it doesn't have to be a permanent split. Maybe there's taking a break or a, a trial separation or something. Right. Like, I just want, to hear something they've learned by being apart. I think that would kind of have to be the it way It would you have go. to be, right? Yeah. Because we what we just saw was yeah, the the joys and baggage of being together for a decade. Yeah. So I I would be curious it's like what is it like yeah to have been apart after that. I'm I, I'm, I'm happy to hear you guys say that just cuz like that's how I feel. I feel like before midnight yeah, it tries to wrap it up into a nice little bow really quickly in the last like 5 minutes, but I'm just like Ooh, everything too we much just there. went through. So I want my think my before midday would be they've been divorced for five years yeah. and they're at the twins' graduation or something, and then we watch them sort of re fairy tale into something that by the end of it we feel like this actually feels like it's going to stick this time, but they had to go through the fire in order to get there, you know. Or it's or it's not a traditional, you know, 
idea of like it's sticking you know it's more, mm-hmm. maybe it's more of like we are gonna be in each other's lives for the rest of our lives but maybe not in the way that we thought right. you know it could right. be something more complicated it's not binary we're together or we're not together right sure. yeah. i mean yeah. i don't think either one of these characters believes in monogamy so oh, like, sure right that in, was implied in, in any sort of yeah, yeah in any sort right. of philosophical like that's an important part way. also so it's pretty clear that he like cheated on her yeah as yeah. another for sure well i think yeah. i think it's i think both ways and he even talked about how he referenced almost a philosophical discussion they've yeah. had in the past of like are we going to own each other are we going to yeah, like, when they're not married do by these old rules yeah right so so they're, they're trying to live their like authentic life but also within the constraints of having kids and having families and you know it's it's an interesting dilemma well this is the thing that i think we have to talk about if we are talking about these movies which is that everything in them and about them relies on the power of conversation to connect people and that is sort of the entire premise on which this was launched this idea and and it is stated very clearly in the first movie where Julie Delpy is talking, uh, Selena's talking about if there's any sort of God in this world, it is the space between those of us that are, we're talking to each other and trying to connect to each other. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that connection doesn't have to look like one thing. And that's what these movies are sort of speaking into Mm -hmm. is that like this connection is one thing on that night in Vienna. It's another thing on this day in Paris. It's another thing in this afternoon, evening in the Southern Peloponnese or whatever. But like you'd have to, you, you want that to be existent and resonant. You want to hold that because that's what, whatever the next movie is has to be. It has to be about their attempt Right, because that's what she says. God is in the attempt. This thing, Michael. What's your, what's your before midday? I don't know. I I don't know that I necessarily definitely want them to have split up. I I guess I'm. I think I would be curious to see them try to figure out what is a relationship post kids, because I think that's just a thing that I don't. Mm. You know, again, I'm not equipped to talk about at mm-hmm. all. But I think that's. I, I think, like you were saying, Trisha, them having kids, having twins, like, is a really big factor in a relationship. And yeah. and I think it, there are probably gender dynamics that, like, happen just because of the nature of, like, biology in the world and, like, how it all, our society, like, all those things. History. Right, yeah. So I feel like I'd be really curious to see, like, what is it like post that? Like, if you are, the kids are moving out and on your own, like, what is it like to start a new relationship where it's just the two people finding each other again after having gone through this crazy storm of right. rearing children. Um, so I feel like however they got, they get there, I think it'd be interesting to hear. Right. They could, they could come into that movie, you know, separated or together and yeah. it would still be the beginning of a new chapter. Yeah. yeah so that makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. And again, I think one of the most beautiful things about this is that there are, we sense when we watch this that there's something very real happening. Like the actors are in the, they're in the age bracket of whatever they're right, playing right. and the real time has elapsed and the real experiences have happened to them. Mm-hmm. And so it feels incredibly earned. And so like, you know, when you watch before, before sunrise, they're so young. When you look at them, so you're so young. Oh my gosh. It's like so cute. <laughs> See them on the, yeah. on the train at the beginning. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot. Babies. <laughs> yeah. Look at these babies. They're so idealistic. They believe in everything. Right. But I mean, that's who which most is, of us were. Which, is, we which is also it. painful now being in my 30s. <laughs> but also, 40s us is going to think that about <laughs> us today. Right, exactly. Like, no. All these people. 40s us are going to listen, 50s us are going to listen to this podcast and be like, look at these babies. Right, yeah, no, exactly. Right. right. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's scary. We thought we knew what was coming. Yeah. Well, I think that's for me what makes these movies such an amazing gift. Like, mm. it's yeah. almost yeah. impossible that they could exist and happen and be told over 18 years. Yes. And be such a generous, honest, brutal portrayal of like the happiest thing you can experience and the not happy side of it. Like, that's that's such an amazing thing to have created and put out into the world and like used your life. For. So that's what yeah. I feel just so grateful for these movies. Same. I think too, not to say that the time we're living in is important in any particular way, but I will say the era that these movies sort of covers is 
fascinating and what like even in even if you just even if you want to just frame it in terms of what was happening in movies in this time it was incredibly interesting and weird in this time of transition where there were all these growing pains it feels like where actors were there's like legitimate like indie scene happening and like and people were making movies that shouldn't have been allowed and there was all this tension and all this kind of stuff happening in the early 90s and then in the early aughts there was this other kind of tension going on and you can read that forward and so like they I will say I would wonder like what will our kids think of these movies we don't know you know they they don't they probably won't speak as uniquely to future experiences of life as ours do again going back to even just the technology piece like if they'd wanted to keep in touch they would have had to have written letters and they talk about that they talk about that in the movie like so what i'm gonna write letters to someone overseas that's my plan for staying with this person i connect to it's not practical one of the like weirdly striking moments for me in before midnight is when celine takes out her like her cell phone and takes a picture of the kids and I'm just like you're holding a device that would have fixed all of this <laughs> yeah. if it had existed right. 18 years ago right. and now you're just it's just there and you can just take pictures on it yeah it yeah. probably won't translate in the same way but yeah I don't know I'm here for the fourth one listen oh I don't God. care what it is please give it to us Link so later. give it uh, to us yeah um, alright cool well why don't we go around and talk about what lessons we're going to take away from the before trilogy uh, Brian, you want to start us off? Uh, well, the second movie specifically, I mean, just the urgency, as we talked about, is is so key to me. It's like the fact you can have a movie that's just two people talking and still feel on the edge of your seat because you know that something has to happen. And it, and it, it's not, they're not diffusing a bomb. They're just have to get to this <laughs> place and you just want them to get to that place. Um, and, and, and the fact, of course, that the literally the last line of the movie is the diffuse like you said the catharsis mm-hmm. but yeah. but it's just like you're like waiting does he have to go does he have to go oh he's not gonna go yeah <sighs> <laughs> right. Um, right. and uh and then beyond that just the fact that it is an 80 minute movie with no b plot or c plot and yeah. like the fact that this movie is thought of as as such a you know exemplary movie and uh, you know in filmmaking kind of Oscar thing. Oscar nominee. Yeah, exactly. And it's not a movie that feels like it has to shove in these two other characters who are also going through the a different take on the theme which is <laughs> right. like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that is very well done in plenty of movies, but the fact that sometimes the main thing you care about is the main thing you care about and you don't need more than that. I would so much rather see an 80 minute before sunset than a two hour before sunset where like these other characters are also, you know, hanging out and like in the background and whatever. Uh, so yeah, that's, there's sort of, that's sort of an extension on the urgency lesson or it's just like, let's focus this thing right down to the core. You know, sometimes it's better to make a 20 minute short film than a two hour movie, Mm -hmm. even though one's more marketable than the other. But guess what? If your story is 20 minutes long, tell that story. It's going to be way better than the two hour version of your story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny. I also think the marketability aspect, they, they were talking about in one of the behind the scene features that like before sunrise, wasn't like a box office hit. Like it wasn't this huge success where everyone was like, we need a sequel. And like, Actually, everyone was like, wait, you guys are making a sequel to mm. yeah. that movie? That's kind of weird. But then the trailer came out and kind of in this nine-year period, the internet had happened and there kind of become this this like fan base that had become so obsessed with this thing. And so there's just kind of like a, a beautiful kind of background story that happened that like yeah. they were excited about it and it just so happened that millions of people the around the world was also excited yeah. about it. Yeah, totally. Uh, Trisha? I am such a control freak that it's really hard for me to imagine the process of letting actors into writing. And so this movie is a real challenging call to me um, that maybe I'm not the only person who knows these characters. (laughs) Uh, And so, yeah, just the idea that so much of what we love about this comes straight out of Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy from start to finish. Um, and, and Kim Kreisen, I should say, like she doesn't get enough recognition. She was also an actor that was a friend of Linklater's that created the characters with him. And she gets credit on all three of the movies, not screenplay credit on all three, but she was there. And so, but just the idea that 
storytelling isn't only a thing that screenwriters do or directors do. It's also a thing that actors do. Mm -hmm. And so as as hesitant as I am most times <laughs> to let literally any bit of my control go. Um, that's the lesson I'm going to take away from this movie, which is that there are sometimes things about a character because they, the, the truth is like an actor has to put on this role and live in it and exist in it. And as we've talked about, there is so much that these actors brought to these parts that we would not otherwise have. There's so much rawness that they embody and that goes for the dialogue. It's not just that they said the words with emotions. They also wrote the words with real emotions that really play. And so that's my lesson. Maybe let an actor do a thing <laughs> one time. <laughs> <laughs> one time. One time. It's funny that reminds me of a quote Richard Link Linklater said when talking about the stories he was saying uh, I think I've always been trying to tell stories in a way that to me feels very organic to how life feels, but trying to make that work in the confines of narrative expectation. Mm. And so I feel like that's, I, I think what I've come to appreciate with him is that he he allows this freedom to the actors who have also both like written and directed and stuff, but like also is able to like frame it and kind of make sure it's pointedly moving the narrative forward at the same time. That That's just a, a whole other skill that is impressive to me that he very, seems to have. Very, very. Yeah. Alex? A lesson I took from this movie way back when I first saw it, I think, was just realizing uh, how much the withholding of information and mm. the kind of careful reveal of information at key moments, how uh, just what a magic trick that is. You know, yeah. like you, you immediately reinvigorate a movie by revealing information, not at the beginning, but at the midpoint or later. And so yeah, I remember when I was writing um, the first short film we made together in LA, Michael Workday. Oh yeah. That was my whole, <laughs> that was my whole thing with Workday was just like mm -hmm. withholding information. I think I just watched Before Sunset recently. Okay. <laughs> and I, I was, you know, the, the only reason that little short film works, I think, is because I was doing the Before Sunset model of not revealing all the information until, you know, middle and end. And so it was a, just the two characters talking but you learn by the end what is really going on between them. Um, and yeah, so I just, just because that movie is so effective, you know, when I first saw it, it, it was the first one I saw of the trilogy. So it was my first exposure to like the idea of just a conversation for a whole movie. And I just couldn't believe how captivated I was. And that was my lesson was, wow, it, if they had just said up front, oh, I'm married, I have kids. They said up front, oh, yeah, I've been thinking about you this whole time. So, so much air would have been let out of the, yeah. out of the balloon. And so yeah. withholding it is what keeps the engine going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really hard to boil down yeah. some of the like three most insanely transformative like movies you could watch. Right. Especially, again, be uh, we, those of us that who, who are this age, like we are the people, we are the generation <laughs> nice. of this movie. Yeah. And so like, obviously all of our reactions to it are gonna be gut level strong, so. I've said before, I've, I'm kind of always on the lookout of, for a movie that is like the exemplar of like this technique where you can mm. just see it like happening. And I feel like this for me is such a great example, which ties into what you were saying, Alex, of like the, the facades breaking down. And, and I think what makes, what makes it so accessible to me is that it, it is the kind of thing that happens when you're meeting someone or catching up with someone in real life where you say like, how are you doing? And it's like, oh, I'm doing good. And then like maybe a little bit later, you're like, how are you doing? Well, good, but like, you know, this stuff mm -hmm. is going on. And then by the end of that, you're like, so how are you doing? And it's like, oh my God, everything's terrible. <laughs> right. Just that, that progression. I think yeah. this movie captures that so well and kind of runs on the engine of, like you were saying, the revealing of the information yeah. and the breaking down of the facade. Um, which I appreciate and and to, you know, film school me now appreciates the value of structure, <laughs> that, that that is what structure should be doing, is that kind of forcing the characters to reveal themselves. And like that annoying kid who raised his hand, like it's not about just hitting this beat on this page. So like he's a little bit right. Uh, <laughs> well, because the, the withholding isn't arbitrary. Right. They're withholding right. for a reason. Exactly. Right. You know, yeah. They're, they're exactly. keeping yeah, yeah. an image of themselves. It's not just on page 90 or page 30 you reveal this it's like right they're not revealing it until then because of real reasons yeah they have a lot yeah. to lose right yeah yeah, yeah. movie's so good <laughs> all right cool what's everyone uh been watching this week 
Alex? So uh, Handmaid's Tale season three is back. And oh, really? It's it's like... Can we talk about it? Yeah, we can talk about it. <laughs> okay. It's a show that I I have, so, I have so many mixed feelings about. I love the way it's shot. It's so gorgeous and looks great on my big TV and beautiful music. And so it's just kind of a luscious visual oral experience. Um, but it also just feels like it's just treading water so often and just like yes suffering is can be gorgeous you know but <laughs> can something happen please the one we're we're not caught up this season um but me and my husband have been watching it and the one thing that is keeping me going a little bit is because the season is like maybe rebellion is going to happen it's going to be a little more rebellious than usual but still like plenty of woman suffering <laughs> but like a little bit of rebellious is this is happening so i'm watching handmaid's tale it's really pretty true <laughs> and it is it's really pretty. the actors are all great yes they are elizabeth they're moss. all fantastic elizabeth moss yeah. and couldn't and, agree and more. what's her name uh mm-hmm. miss waterford mass what's her, effect girl yeah, i know her from mass effect yvonne <laughs> strahovski yes love her yeah and bradley whitford's in it what yeah <laughs> what? yeah season two and three yeah, yeah. wait what yes <laughs> Well, now I have to watch this. No, you don't. The whole West Wing. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't come in until like the very end of season two. Yeah. So you, okay. you have no, a no, lot no, to get fine. through. You're I'll fine. just skip. Yeah. To, okay. I mean, I like I'm Bradley. only a couple episodes in. He hasn't done a lot so far. Oh. But I'm sure he will. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. Anyway. Cool. Yeah. That's what I'm watching. Okay. Uh, Trisha, what are you watching? Okay. So uh, I promise I won't spend too much time on it, but I... I have this like long standing, ongoing, deep, deep love of submarine movies. I love movies. <laughs> I love no, them so it. much. Yeah. Uh, I love submarine movies. I think I've basically seen every one of them. And there's a new one that's out that you can rent right now on your streaming or whatever. Uh, it was originally titled Kursk, which is about the real life 2000 Kursk submarine disaster. But it's been recently retitled and re-released in the United States, and it's now called The Command. And it stars, uh, well, it's directed by Thomas Vintnerberg, uh, who I really like. And then it uh, it stars Colin Farrell and Lea Seydoux and my favorite actor right now, Matthias Schoenertz, who is this marvelous he's marvelous he's beautiful. <laughs> i'm sorry he's there are so no, be- he's there are so, no words he's so beautiful that it really just everything flies out of my brain when have, i want to talk about him <laughs> have we have i seen him in any, anything yeah so he plays the villain in red sparrow i've not seen that. okay he plays the villain in red sparrow he also plays the love interest in far from the madding crowd which is another thomas vinterberg movie with also carrie mulligan who i love so much uh and he's gonna be in the new steven soderberg movie with meryl streep and Gary Oldman. And oh. I know. So, but anyway, Matthias Schoenertz is so, so, so good in it. It's this amazing submarine movie. It is, the, it's called The Command. The trailer that they've cut makes it look like the stupidest action movie you've ever seen. It is not a stupid action movie. It is a really, really good taut submarine thriller movie based on a true life event, which of course is my jam because I love history so much. It's, it's one of those better than it looks. Uh, <laughs> so, so what, a lot, a lot better than it looks. What, and his performance in it is spectacular. Sorry. What draws you to submarine movies? Because I feel like I feel very claustrophobic and like uncomfortable in submarine movies. Mm. What draws me to submarine movies? Well, there's, there's all of this built in tension because right. they're already it's existing. It's kind of like a space movie. It, it, yeah. It's exactly that. They're already like... Going outside will kill you. So (laughs) the element of containment is really, really strong. And then it's actually weirdly like zombie movies in that in that regard. Hmm. Sure, going outside will kill you. You can't leave this space. Totally torpedoes. No, I I love that. I I love that. There's always because of the hierarchy of usually the military situation that they have. There's a lot of like jostling that has to happen for like command authority like virtually every submarine movie is like who's in charge like that's sort of a Mm. huge issue and then there's again all of these like inherent disasters that can and do happen always like there's pressure underneath the sea and then there's like explosive things in your vessel with you i just love them so much very stressful (laughs) yes but the best one of course is dust boot but if you don't have really of course of course it is i haven't seen that one okay 
thought you were going to say The Hunt for Red October, which is one of my favorite movies. No, it's, The Hunt for Red October is really good. But anyway, but if you don't have time to watch either one of those movies because they are lengthy, you can just check out The Command. Great. Awesome. Brian? So a few months ago, I couldn't go an episode without talking about Kurosawa. And now apparently I can't go an episode without talking about Terry Gilliam. Uh, All right. Because when I talked about The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, I said it was a movie that I'd been waiting to be made since the early 2000s. Another Terry Gilliam movie that I was waiting to be made since the early 2000s was uh, his adaptation of Good Omens, the book mm-hmm. by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, which is one of my top five favorite books of all time. I read it a couple times growing up and loved it. And he was going to make uh, an adaptation with Robin Williams as Aziraphale the angel and Johnny Depp as Crowley the demon. And I was like great like these are both gilliam alumni like this is perfect and then it never happened i remember it was one of those i was like checking imdb every week to see like has it gone into production yet what's going on and then finally years 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 later amazon announces they're making a six-part miniseries with michael sheen and david tennant and i'm like okay i'm on board (laughs) for this francis mcdormand is the voice of god benedict cumberbatch is the voice of satan brian cox is the voice of death john ham's there uh (laughs) As he always is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truly. Just being hilarious. Yeah. yeah. And uh and yeah, I, I watched it all in a day and uh and I loved it. You know, I I it's really hard for me to recommend simply because I have no idea what the experience is if you mm-hmm. haven't read the book. But as someone who's read the book, it it just sort of made me so happy that I was like, I'm actually watching this. It's yeah. actually happening and it feels very true to to the story that I remember. And it was like even when it was over a couple hours later i just sort of had this moment of going like it happened <laughs> like this thing that i wanted to have it i got to see it and i, yeah. and I want to like watch it i don't want to watch it again tomorrow but i want to watch it again in like a few months or something and sort of re-experience it so uh yeah i personally loved it you may love it if you like british humor that's not necessarily doesn't have to be the most high production type thing because it's not what the point is the point is about the the dialogue and the relationships and everything then check it out Awesome. Cool. Uh, So my thing is actually a podcast episode um, that uh, so it's an episode of Script Notes, which if if you listen to the Mm -hmm. most recent episode with John August, you will be familiar with Script Notes. Uh, But recently there was an episode of Script Notes that John wasn't a part of and it was just his co-host Craig Mason and it was Craig Mason uh, called How to Write a Movie. And I actually hadn't listened to this episode. Uh, one of the patrons from Lessons from the Screenplay, Chester, recommended it. And so I listened to it. And it actually ties into kind of what we've been talking about here, where it's 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 a podcast all about kind of how to use structure from a writing standpoint. Because mm. often we talk about structure from the analytical, right. like, you know, taking apart something that's already been created, but that doesn't necessarily help you when you're sitting down to write a movie. And so I feel like he does a really good job of kind of summarizing how to take that analytical knowledge and reframe it in a way that makes it productive when actually writing things. And Mm -hmm. and something that I feel like I've been trying to get across on the channel and he does it very nicely in just this 40 minute little podcast episode. I think what's so So. good about it is he kind of just tells a story almost. He's just Mm kind of like, so, the next thing that like really is going to happen to your character is is this right? So that's what this is, and like, it just it makes it almost so obvious yeah. and like in, intuitive that mm-hmm. it, it it gets you out of the mindset of like what are the rules and am I breaking the rules or what do I do? Yeah, yeah. and it's also why I like John York's book Into the Woods, which we've talked about, because he, he goes into the psychology of why structures exist. Uh, you know, just because of our brains and how we like to have yeah. archetypal stories told and stuff. And how life works. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like how this is this is the way we learn. So this is why our stories reflect that. We do the wrong thing until we can't do it anymore. <laughs> right, and then maybe <laughs> we change. <laughs> Storytelling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the How to Write a Movie episode of Script Notes is, is my recommendation. Awesome. Well, we got a plane to catch, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to miss that plane. I know. Hmm. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Screenplay on Before Sunset and all the Before movies, which are amazing. Thank you for listening. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review. It always helps. We have a Patreon now. Uh, there's exclusive stuff there. Go check it out. It's cool. Follow us on Twitter. All the things. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll, we'll see you next episode. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.